Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, sorry for the trouble. Um, I have 10 minutes left and I will just make it quick. No problem. Uh, I will improvise and uh, let's get started. So my name is Tobias. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about public GraphQL APIs today. Um, I'm co-founder and CTO at Brickle and it's a real pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to talk about, uh, I will get started to just talk about in general about public APIs just to get started with the topic. And then I will dive in to GraphQL because we are in the GraphQL track here, so make some relations to GraphQL itself. And then I will keep it very high level in this talk. It's not going to be technical. It's going to be more about food for thought, like what you can do with GraphQL, but not really about how to do it. Uh, we will have talks uh, later about around that, very technical talks, or to tell you more how to approach this with GraphQL. So I will talk about challenges and opportunities that you have with public GraphQL APIs. So there are two kind of uh, approaches for APIs, right? You have open APIs that are like shared and freely available online, for example. And then you have public APIs. Public APIs in this talk, um, we will assume a public API is something that is public for use. So something that is available for someone. So in this talk, it's really going to be um, anyone that has access to this API, we will consider this as public. And uh, this is only for certain users, maybe depending on their authentication or authorization, they will have access to this API. And uh, sorry for the watermarks, uh, because I shared the slides, so don't worry, I actually paid for those images. Um, it just uh, exported, so um, I'm using Canva, obviously. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's talk about the API scope. Um, we will actually have a talk right after uh, from Orion um, about how to build and maintain uh, GraphQL APIs, uh, public GraphQL APIs. And normally what you have is like you have a different API scope. So it really goes from internal API, which is probably much more available for you internally as an API that you can use. Then maybe you have like a preview API available for certain users or certain partners. And then you have the real public API available maybe to everyone or like a certain group of users. So that's about public APIs overall. Let's dive into GraphQL. What is special about GraphQL and public APIs? So there's kind of like uh, two things. If you talk to your users or your developers, they will be very happy because they can define the data they want, right? This is amazing for front-end developers. They really like it. But then, how about the ops team? Uh, what are they going to think about? They're going to think, oh my god, they can define what they want, they can do whatever they want, right? So it is kind of like you have good and bad on both sides. So if you think about public GraphQL APIs, it's kind of like this one. So you can't really tell, uh, is that good or bad? What are you going to do about it? So how to handle this? So there's challenges and there's opportunities that you have with, uh, with those. Um, so first of all, the, the issue itself is, um, if you have an internal API, you're already use, uh, used to your users. So you mostly have developers internally, you can communicate, and you kind of uh, can predict the results that you're going to get um, from them. So you can do things like all the queries that are defined in your front end, they are static. That means you can use like a build process, for example, to define like whitelisting, or you can hash the queries. Uh, so you can do some persi persistent queries, so it's easier to handle caching and other kind of approaches that are not available for external users. So it's kind of like unpredictable. You, you don't really know what you're going to get, especially for a GraphQL API. It's really hard to tell before um, what the usage is going to be and what kind of fields they're going to use, for example. So it seems like it's possible because there's quite a number of companies um, that have public GraphQL APIs uh, available. So you have GitHub, for example, you have Shopify, you have Yelp, and a few more companies coming up uh, now with like maybe beta releases for the GraphQL APIs. So it, it is possible to do, but there's really quite some, some challenges that you have to tackle. So what are they? Um, one thing that a lot of times comes up is like mutations are a pain. 
uh, especially if you have like server to server communication for example people will tell you mutations are really a pain to to maintain or to implement for developers because they're used to the rest approach to just simple http requests that they can send um, in graphql it might be a change for them so they feel like mutations are really a pain to implement and kind of like boilerplate for them to do so um, this is what you're going to hear a lot. Another reason is probably uh, GraphQL clients. It's still early on, so there's not so many GraphQL uh, clients available. There's more coming out step by step, but uh, there's only just a few of them that are really solid um, that you can use for implementation. But um, maybe a better approach is to just like write in CLI or tool for your users. So, which kind of wraps the GraphQL request into something simpler, like a builder pattern or something that you want to use as a CLI instead of pure GraphQL requests. Another one is caching. So, what I mentioned is like you get unpredictable usage. That also uh, comes with challenges in terms of caching. So, many times you will hear maybe GraphQL and caching is like difficult or not even possible. So. It's really uh, a new challenge for you as an API maintainer to come up with solutions um, to cache uh, requests properly in GraphQL because the diversity is so much more than in, in the REST world, for example. And also control the usage. So in REST, um, let's say you can really kind of predict the API calls and you know like what resources are going to be used for your API calls. But in GraphQL, it's really hard to know uh, not only the number of calls, but the complexity of them. So are they going to nest the fields? How much they're going to request um, is really hard to predict. So you need to do a lot of parsing based on the queries that they send to find out the usage. And another problem that you have, uh, since GraphQL is fairly new, um, there's no real conventions. We have the GraphQL schema itself as a, a nice documentation and reference for your API, but still there's no real common standards how to approach, uh, for example, naming. So you have different uh, frameworks available like Hasura or Prisma or other implementations that offer you like a generated GraphQL schema, but they all have different approaches on how they name things. And this, this kind of challenging to find out the standard, how you use GraphQL APIs these days, wherever you look at, they're going to be different. There's no common ground. And the question you're always going to have is like how you integrate third-party API data, which is kind of a challenge all the time. Doesn't matter use GraphQL or not, but how you can expose this data through one single API endpoint. And this is not only a challenge, but actually an opportunity. So let's talk about opportunities that you're going to have with public GraphQL APIs. First of all, um, the real benefit of GraphQL is always developer experience. It's not really about underfetching, overfetching, or whatever. It's really if you just watch the talk from Carlos, for example, you get amazing developer experience using GraphQL for your, especially for your front-end developers. And if you're a company that um, offer services that are available, for example, for headless uh, usage. So you hear a lot these days about headless approach, headless commerce, headless CMS, and so on. If you have a GraphQL API, it's really amazing for developers to come up with new apps and implementation of your API. So this is really amazing use case um, that you can offer to developers to make it available for them. Then the next one is tracing and insights. So with GraphQL, you have more complexity and more fields uh, that can be used in different combinations. But this also gives you some abilities. So you can find out usage patterns. You can find out performance metrics down to the field level. And you can also have more logging insights and uh, also privacy controls. So you can actually find out um, if you have like a request, which kind of field was used at some point and which user exited it, for example. So really down to the field level gives you an opportunity to do privacy control or logging and many more um, opportunities that also uh, Orian gonna talk about. And then still, I wanna mention overfetching because I think there's a problem today um, if we take webhooks, for example. If you have webhooks, if you subscribe to webhooks, you always get like a bunch of data that probably you're not going to use. Like most of the time you have webhooks and you get the, the whole data and you maybe only use two or three fields. So why don't we use GraphQL 
also for server-to-server -server communication in the future to make it more efficient to save network requests and save also the data that's sent over the wire. And GraphQL is perfect for that. So there's real use case where GraphQL can come into play in the future. And another one really, since GraphQL is uh, not really a hype technology, but uh, coming up step by step and gives you new opportunities, there's also an opportunity to monetize it. So how you come about this approach to uh, just uh, offer one API for everyone, for all the services that you offer, but also integrate. So really API integration is like a new business model that you can offer, especially with GraphQL, because you have only one endpoint that you can offer to everyone. And one example of that is I want to mention OneGraph. Uh, I think we have a talk about OneGraph today as well. It's really a nice uh, approach, an example, how you can maybe go about the future uh, using different APIs and integrate them into one single endpoint that is available. So take a look at OneGraph or go speak to Sean. Uh, he will present also later. Um, it's really a nice example that you can uh, take a look at. And if you're interested to find out more, uh, I recommend you to take a look at productionreadygraphql.com. Um, this is by Marc-André Giroux. Uh, he's a developer at uh, GitHub, and he has a lot of uh, nice blog posts and information about this topic. And also try out the GitHub or Shopify API. You will get to know no more about uh, how they approach uh, public GraphQL APIs. Or just talk to your front-end developers or businesses or your developers that are available for, for your services, that are using your service as an API, you will find out uh, interesting insights how you can go about the implementation. And with that, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? If we still have some time, I don't know. Any questions? Well, thank you for the talk. It was really, it was really good. I mean, that was a condensed, rushed. <laughs> um, that's basically the worst scenario for any speaker is having their, yeah. their slides work, uh, not work, but it was really great. So if you have any questions, do find Tobias during the breaks or during lunch or anything, and I'm sure he's happy to, to fill it up.